In the days of medieval glory, Bridlington Priory was one of the greatest monastic houses of England. Its wealth and possessions made it a key monastery in the north, one of the largest and richest of the Augustinian order. The church in those times was more than twice as large as what now remains, rivaling in size other great Yorkshire churches, including Beverley Minster and Selby Abbey. The Priory today is a glorious survival of that pre-Reformation splendour. Now shorn of its great choir, housed in the shrine of St John of Brimlington, its transepts and its stage, stately central tower, over which soared a stone crown similar to those above the cathedrals of Newcastle, Edinburgh St Giles. There was already a church in Brimlington at the time of the Doomsday Survey in 18, 1086 even, and it's likely that this its existing site was chosen for the new foundation of the Priory's, by the Priory's founder, Walter de Grant, Lord of the Manor, whose father Gilbert was one of the new aristocracy established in England following the Norman Conquest of 1066. William the Conqueror's son, Henry I, was on the throne when the foundation charter was prepared in 1113 to 1114. In it, de Grant declared that he had established canons regular in the Church of St Mary at Bridlington. By the, by the authority and conquest of King Henry, for his soul and the souls of his father and mother, and the souls of my father and mother, and our own soul and the souls of my friends. The Order of Augustinian Canons was new to England, having arrived around 1100 AD, so de Grant's foundation was amongst the earliest of the country, and almost certainly the first in Yorkshire. The Augustinians, or the Austin Canons, were priests who formed communities in the, uh, to live in the monastic life but their rule was not quite as strict as that followed by the monks of other orders. In many cases, as at Bridlington, part of the monastic church was set aside for parish worship. The Priory expanded around its church. Its monastic buildings spread out mainly on the south side of the site, including a chapter house, Priory's hall, cloister, dormitory, infirmary, while to the north were farm buildings. All are vanished today, apart from some remains of the cloisters. The early years were not without trials, and it is said that the Priory came under siege during the civil wars of King, Stephen's, King Stephen's reign. The period, however, was also a time of tremendous ex expansion in the monastic life of England, and it was Stephen who granted the Priory jurisdiction over the port and harbour of Bridlington. By 1200 AD, the Priory was sufficiently in control of its affairs for King John to grant a licence for the Prior and Canons to hold an annual two-day fair and a weekly market. There were problems of discipline, however, uncovered by visitations later in the 13th century. Canons would be said to, uh, were said to be absent or malingering in the infirmary, while others kept an excess of horse and hounds. Though poor during its early history, the Priory acquired lands in many parts of Yorkshire and Lincolnshire, and with them came sheep farming on a large scale, the wool trade being the chief source of its growing wealth. This wealth was expressed in stone when early in the 13th century the canons began the, to build their greatest new church, a work which continued in some measure during the next 300 years and was still incomplete. The two west towers remaining without their upper stages when Henry VIII shattered the monasteries. The Priory became a centre of literary culture through, accession, uh, through a succession of scholarly inmates, including its fourth prior, known as Robert the Scribe, William of Newborough, the author of the Chronicle of English History, and Canon Peter of Langtoft whose work included a history of England written in French verse. In the 15th century, George Ripley, a canon of Bridlington, achieved, in, achieved international fame as a philosopher and alchemist. The drama of national affairs caught up with Bridlington in 1322, when Edward II, defeated by the Scots at Old, um, Old Byland, sought refuge in the Priory for a single fraught night before heading off by devious ways to York, the Scots in hot pursuit. Many of the canons too, briefly migrated with their treasures to the relative safety of Lincolnshire. The most illustrious of Bridlington Priors was John of Thwing, who led the Priory from 1362 to his death in 1379, and in 1401 became the last English saint to become created before the Reformation. Born in the near nearby Wold village of Thwing around 1320, he studied at Oxford and returned to Bridlington to become a member of the monastic community and eventually the prior. A deeply devout man who shrank from all vainglory as from a deadly poison. John was reported as the source of miracles and healing and saving of lives. After his death, the miracles increased. His grave became a place of pilgrimage, resulting in a commission of inquiry and the process leading to a canonization by Pope Boniface IX. With John's ele elevation 
to sainthood, Bridlington achieved high status nationality. St John's Shine, an elaborate structure at the east end of, of the now vanished choir, and a chapel behind the high altar attracted pilgrims in the same way that Thomas Becket at Canterbury. They included Lancasterian kings, Henry VIII, Henry V. St John is recorded as the special patron of Henry V, while Prince of Wales and the Earl of Ardrul stated he had visited the shrine with the prince. Henry returned as, as the king in 1421. It was a visit marked by a personal tragedy for the king. On progress, both the, uh, the shrines of the 8th century monk bishop St John of Beverley and the more recent St John of Bridlington, he had invoked the aid of both, uh, both for his great victory at Agincourt. Leaving soon after, uh, learning soon after leaving Beverley that his brother Thomas of Clarence, heir presumptive to the throne, had died in battle in France. The House of Lancaster held Rai John in especially high esteem, for later in the 15th century he was also venerated by King Henry VI, who was himself to become a candidate for sainthood. It was this Henry who founded a choir school at the Priory, establishing a, choir, a choiral tradition which continues to this day in the choir boys and adults. The high spiritual status which Bridlington Priory has attained, thanks to its new saint, was confirmed in 1409 when the Pope confirmed on the prior the, uh, the privilege of wearing a mitre and ring, a dignity shared north of the Trent only by the, ben by the Benedict Abbots of St Mary at York and Selby. The prestige attached to the reputation of St John played its part in the construction of the Bailgate today, the only substantial survival of the Priory apart from the church itself. The great entry to the Priory precincts was built following a licence issued by Richard II in 1388 to fortify the Priory, Priory even, though there is little evidence that anything other than the, than the grand but functional gatehouse was built by way of defence. Under Priory John, the Priory attained the height of its medieval sanctuary. With its last prior William Wood, the monastery's final annals were written as a high tragedy. Wood was caught up in the pilgrimage of grace, sparked off in 1536 by the dissolution of the lesser monasteries, and the well-formed fear that the greater houses, including Bridlington, would soon suffer a similar fate. Wood was summoned to London, arrested and accused of giving the rebels aid both financially and by the supply of manpower. Part of his defence was that the rebels had said they would cut off his head at his own door if he refused to help. Wood was convicted of treason and hanged at Tyburn. After his death, the end of the community followed swiftly. The process of dissolution was already in hand as Wood faced trial, and by 1539 the buildings apart from the nave and the bell gate were in ruins. The Augustinian canons dis dispersed, the Grand Shrine of St John destroyed. Ironically, it is the report of the destroyers which tells us most about the Priory's treasures, including the shrine and a fair chapel on high having e on either side a stair of stone that's a going come by. Under the East Edge Shrine be five chapels with five altars and a small tables of alabaster and images. The Duke of Norfolk, the first of Henry VIII's agents charged with the destruction, stood in awe at the sides of the Priory's great barn and and reported that he would have stolen three retables from the shrine of St John to send to the Queen if I durst be a thief. Thomas Cromwell, the King's chief minister, told of the, of the people of Bridlington desire to keep the church and the, and the shrine, but Cromwell informed Norfolk that they should not be seduced in the offering of their money and ordered that the shrine should be dismantled and the jewels and plate sent to London. From then until the present day, the Priory has been the parish church of St Mary. I have here Lee, who is currently studying towards his Masters in History, and has written his dis dissertation on the Priory in Bridlington. So Lee, can you tell me a bit about the Church's restoration over the years? Sure. It has undergone several restorations, the latest completion in the 1990s, and the work of preservation goes on, with a recent successful appeal to raise £600,000 to restore and rebuild the famous 19th century organ. The major change in the church's appearance since the reformation was the construction of the upper parts of the two western towers during the 19th century restoration under Gilbert Scott. The towers were built isometrically to reflect the Constantine styles of the west front, the northwest tower in the early English style and its much higher southwest partner in the more ornate perpendicular style. 
If you'd like more information or to visit the Bridlington Priory, then please head to their website, bridlingtonpriory.co.uk, to find out more about opening times and further information about the Priory itself.